episode, we're going to go over the things to look for when buying a used jet ski. We get a lot of questions online about things to look for, whether it has to do with the, the engine, ride plates, whatever, the whole ski itself. So this week, we're going to go over things to look for when you're on Facebook late at night before you go to bed, like Nick and I, and you find a killer deal that seems too good to be true. All right, guys, step one when looking at your Facebook purchase in person is the obvious. Take a look at the haul. So what we normally do is we take a walk around the whole ski itself, look for any kind of gouges, gashes, anything that may or may not need to be repaired. Um, <clears throat> we also like to look and see, obviously, the gel coat. As you can see here, there's some fading where a sticker was. That'll probably buff out. But if you do have a gouge that needs to be repaired, replaced, new fiberglass, something like that, keep in mind, it's probably not gonna look factory. There's gonna be some inconsistency, whether it's with the color, the texture, so be it. So keep in mind, if you do have a gouge that's you know somewhere where the graphics go, not a big deal because obviously it's gonna be covered up like a band-aid. We also like to take a look at you know the seats, handlebars, because that gives you an indication as to where this thing's been sitting for the last 30 years. Uh, most of the skis that we buy are either you know outside, don't have a cover on them, they're under a tree. So the seats, the handlebars are pretty much, I don't know, decayed. So keep that in mind, you're gonna need a new seat cover. You're gonna try to have to clean up handlebar pads or find one to replace it with if you're not doing UMI. Um, same goes with the hoods. These usually fade pretty quick. Not that you can't clean them up, but again, it's not gonna look perfect. Um, so just keep that in mind. And then lastly, I would say just again, you know, look underneath the bottom of the hole, see how there's any scratches or whatnot, because that'll give you an indication as to the previous owner's history, if they were beaching it or whatnot. Um, and then yeah, just use your gut. All right, so like Nick said, um, in regards to the hood, the hood most of the time is 100% stable. However, if you've had some Joe Schmo that was on Facebook and decided to use a heat gun and it looks like crap, it's not gonna come back because they have melted that plastic. Otherwise, if you have a hood that's lightly faded like this one, you can get it back to almost brand new looking if you follow our uh, DIY video, which we have in our library. In terms of the handlebar pad, you can do the same technique that we used on our video in the hood and bar pad that uh, we've done before. However, on this bar pad, even though it looks like it's just dirty, since it has been somewhat like sitting, I don't know where it was sitting, obviously it wasn't outside, but wherever it was, you can dig your nail into this and get like rubber off, you could never save this. There's nothing to make this rubber harder. Like the boiled linseed oil and everything else that you see online is not gonna make this harder. Um, there's, there's absolutely no saving this. So in that case, you would have to get a used one. Um, but everything else that has like a little bit of light fade on it, you know, quick little scotch brake pad and then uh, some trim uh, ceramic coating look, look brand new. So we're gonna move to the inside of the hall. Well, actually, before we move to the inside of the hall, there's a couple other things we can do on the outside of the hall. Um, one being the uh, jet pump. So let's take a peer through that jet pump and tell you what to look for. All right, so looking through this jet pump, obviously the clearances, hopefully you can see that camera, the clearances are very good. They don't have any big nicks out of the uh, wear ring or anything like that. So if you put this thing on the water, it probably would perform as long as everything else is good on the inside, it perform as uh, it would due to any factory uh, setup. Um, so that would be good, but you can also, when you look through this with a flashlight, you can see if there's ever been, one, if it's ever been off. So like this one's still black, so it looks like this is either a factory replacement or factory. I would doubt that this was ever taken apart because it's got like 27 hours on it. But um, you can also see the condition of the impeller, and the impeller doesn't have any bends on or anything like that, so chances are I was never throwing a rock through it. Uh, the other thing to look for is if you come back here on the hull, um, this is a factory install okay so that's real nice not gobbed up black rtvs on it and it looks somewhat factory um if someone had touched this throughout the years that would look like a mess there's just no other way i mean if you're very careful you can make it look like that again but there's no way that somebody took this off and made it look that clean unless it was like a professional shop or a bombardier themselves so chances are that this is this assembly has never been taken off uh, but you can tell a lot through the jet pump of its life, what it's gone through, everything else. But like Nick touched on earlier, you can look at the bottom and see if it's been beach slot. If it's been beach slot, then I'm sure it's had something go through it. All right, next step, you're gonna wanna pop your hood, which you can check, check the bin. Usually this is an indicator if anything's been replaced. Like you can see in here, there's some screwdrivers and stuff that actually came on with this ski. So obviously something's been swapped or whatnot, but see if you got all your goodies in there. You're gonna pull this out. 
we're gonna take a look at some of the fuel system. So for starters, we're gonna take a look at the tank. Um, if this was uh, a factory replacement tank or whatnot, you know, during the recall, it would have a barcode. Um, usually it's on the, the top here on the side, um, which this one does not have one, so I assume that's probably... I believe the 97, 98, 99 tanks got re, like, redone design-wise, and they don't crack in the filler necks anymore. I don't think there's open recalls in 97, 98, 99, but if you have a 95 and 96, um, you could call your local dealer to see if they can get a replacement tank, but I know they're scarce from COVID and stuff still, so. COVID. Yeah. Coronavirus. Um, the next thing we're gonna check too is the, the fuel lines. So this one here has the original gray fuel lines, which if you remember Nick saying, uh, these are prone to getting the uh, green goo, is that correct? Yes, sir. The, the green goo, which, uh, is a big no-no because if that gets sucked into your car, then you're really SOL. Um, so you know, just just take a look and see because obviously these will need to be replaced. Yes, so, 100%. You know, if you have green goo, you are 100% replacing those lines. Yeah, so that that would be a good starting point to look. Um, if they are a different color, they probably have been replaced, but I, we would recommend replacing it either way just so you can sleep at night. Um, so again, factor in that cost as well, the cost of fuel lines when it comes to um, revamping a back air Brian ski. Okay, if you've made it this far, you've looked over the hull, checks out. Looked inside the pump, checks out. Looked at the fuel lines, everything else, you're cool with having to replace fuel lines, got a good tank in it. Body-wise, everything, you're happy, and you're gonna move on to the engine bay. So for the engine bay, you need two tools. You need a 13 16 uh, socket for your spark plugs, and you need a compression tester, because you're gonna see how good the motor is before you go any further than this. But before you do that, you can do a couple things right off the bat. You're gonna take the key, you're gonna install the key, on your desk post. You should have two beeps. If you don't have two beeps, the beeper's broken. Not a big deal, 20 bucks. But at the same time as you put that on, if you wash your fuel gauge, your fuel gauge should go up, okay? Now the fuel gauge didn't move when we did this, so that tells you right off the bat, the sender's bad, which is the F1 fuse inside the sender. Unfortunately, it's not as simple as replacing a fuse. You have to cut the sender open, solder it together on the actual motherboard, put the piece of uh, cutout that you just had in, use a zip tie, plastic, weld that thing back in, and reinstall the whole tank. Not a huge deal, and we're gonna do a video for you guys uh, shortly on that, but you will have to remove the oil tank, slide the tank forward, remove all your lines, which you should be replacing lines anyways, unless they were completely just redone and you can prove it, and then uh, pull the sender, put it on the bench, do all the stuff in reverse order and install it back. So it's like an hour, hour and a half job, depending on how good you are at it, and uh, just know that you'll have to do that. Now the other thing too, is that while you have your key on, you can test your VTS. So looking at your gauge, if you hit the button down, your gauge, it should go all the way down. Hitting it up, it should go all the way up. Now if it works, but the gauge doesn't work, then the gauge is bad. If you just hear a click, it could be a couple things. We'll go over that shortly, but don't rule out the VTS until you're able to check this. And some people might not let you check this because you have to take apart electrical, but We'll get into that. So for, without further ado, let's do a compression test to see if this thing's even worth purchasing. All right, so first step you're gonna do for compression test, you're gonna remove your air tube, a little bit of water in there. Remove your air tube, you're going to take your spark plug wires, and you're going to install them on the rear box. It has two metal posts right by the battery. This one does not have them, so just be aware of where you're putting the spark plugs because obviously, if it gets an arc and arcs through here and there's flammable fumes inside the hull, it goes boom, boom. Now skeet, skeet though, just a boom, boom, oh. okay? So these spark plugs were already loose. If not, you would've used your spark plug wrench, obviously, right? So we're going to take our first spark plug out. We're going to install our compression tester. Again, compression testers are kind of a dangerous thing because if you buy a cheap compression tester, then, well, it might not be accurate. So just be aware of that. Like I know the Harbor Freight ones, I think are like 30 pounds off. So if you test something and it seems way off, I'd, I'd pull in a different compression tester. All right, so we have it installed in the front cylinder. We're looking for like 150, 155 for a healthy engine. If it's more than that, happy fucking day. We are going to grab the throttle and we are going to hold the throttle wide open, okay? With the throttle held wide open, we're gonna install our key and we're going to hit the start button until the gauge stops moving. Should be like maybe 10 seconds. Oh no. Okay, so we got 180. This is an accurate gauge. Well, we got like 175-ish. This is an accurate gauge I use on every single one of my engines, so I know it's 100%. So again, this thing has like either 17 or 24 hours on it when I, when I checked the uh, MPEM. 
So this obviously is a healthy engine. Remember your first number because we're going to do a, uh, the same thing we did on the front as the rear cylinder, check that, and then come back to see if they are within a percentage of each other. All right, uh, we are now installed in the rear cylinder. We're gonna do the same order of operations. We're going to hold the throttle wide open. Gauge stopped, identical to the front cylinder. This is a perfect healthy engine, which is a shame, dude, because we're gonna pull this bitch apart and put a race engine in it. So, there you go. Perfectly healthy engine. If you're satisfied with all your checkpoints up until this point, keep going, because it's a damn good ski. Okay, so visually inspect the hull inside now. Um, obviously we can see some oil in the hull from the front to the rear. Now it could be because somebody filled up the oil tank, which is right above us right now, and it spilled down, or it could be that something's leaking. So make sure you just kind of visually go through, check all of your oil lines if you can. Um, there's, there's not really much you can do at this point. Obviously you're gonna have to tear this thing apart to see if it is leaking, which is somewhat of a tedious job, but just be aware that if you have some oil in the hull, you need to find out how it got in it. All right, so your next step uh, is going to be to check the exhaust. Now, there's not a lot you can check internal-wise, but you can check your uh, water bung. So, this one, which is up top, when it's installed the engine, right, usually never gets corroded, but this one, since water sits in here, water will start eating away at this, and it'll have to be an item that you're going to have to fix. Now, obviously, there's a couple fixes for this. You can do JV weld, which I would not recommend. The best way to do it is to weld it. So, if you feel inside of the hull, you should be able to feel the corrosion with your finger. If you feel any type of distortion with paint, it's not, it's not smooth like this, then figure the fact that you're gonna have to replace this bung, either having it professionally welded or JV welding it, which JV weld is only gonna last a certain amount of time. You get this, this constant expansion, contraction, it's gonna become loose, it's gonna leak over time, you're gonna be doing it again, so just take the pipe out, do it the right way. Yeah, buy once, buy once, cry once. Yeah. All right, so again, back in the uh, engine compartment here, just want to double check the fuel lines again. As you can see, these are the factory gray lines, which again, we highly recommend replacing these since they are original. Not even an option. If you're going to do it right, you've got to replace them. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Miyagi. You're welcome, sir. Um, because again, you don't want that green goo getting up in your carbs and potentially blowing your motor, um, which we do have a video on our, on our page as to how to replace these and where to get these lines from. Um, the cool thing too is they come in different colors. So not only can you enhance the performance of the engine, but you can also make it yours. So if you want different colors, things like that, um, it's just another way to make it your ski and not the old person's ski. Yeah. If that makes sense. I love it. Okay. Uh, what else do we have in here? Uh, um, okay, so. Well, also too, quick note, before you do all this, just look and see if anything seems off. Like me, I, I don't necessarily know the mechanics 100%, I'm still learning, but like, when I look in here, this looks complete. I mean, nothing seems out of place or missing. Yeah, the only uh, thing I noticed is by that rear box, there's like a... This? Yeah, there's like that aluminum plate. Yeah. Of like, maybe I like broke and fix it, which isn't a big deal. Rear box on eBay is like 20, 25 bucks. So right, because crazy, but. I would assume most people who are buying these skis know what they're doing, but you know, for a first timer like myself, again, if something looks off, it probably is um, and, and not saying that people are shady but when you buy something online we all know how it goes um, they what tell do you mean you dude it just needs a battery it runs fine yeah it, it ran when I put it away 32 years ago yeah those um, are things you gotta look out for right so, needs a starter yeah come yeah. on bro so again I, we're getting technical but just use common sense you know look at it make sure everything's whole if not I mean it's just another excuse to jack the guy down on price or gal down on price um, but just wanted to add that in for a, a newbie but. What a what a, what a nice tip, bro. Yeah, that's a, that's a pro tip. Pro pro tip. tip. But again, um, yeah, this thing looks whole. It's just dirty, so it just needs to get clean. It's and, extremely uh, dirty. It looks like it's leaking oil somewhere. Hopefully, it's just from the tank or a line. But we're gonna blow it apart anyways. Which sucks because this thing's. I, I would just go ride this right now. <laughs> All right. So, well, as you said earlier, if your VTS for whatever reason is not working, and the guy that you're trying to buy of guy or girl you're trying to buy us off of is cool with it. There's three tabs on the VTS. You're gonna pull the cover off. Kind of get a little visual of the of the motor. Now, obviously, that motor. Again, this is a 27 hour ski. That motor is freaking mint. So, if you have one that's super corroded, then it could be the motor that's bad. But if it's not the motor, it could possibly be a fuse in the rear box, which is. I don't know, I don't think people, anybody's gonna let you take the rear box out, but if they do, check the fuses. There's two fuses in the rear box, check those and see if the VTS works after that. If not, I would plan on uh, buying a VTS or a VTX trim fix. 
Again, that's only if you put the key on and you have power to it and you can, you can like audibly hear it click, 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 click when you hit the buttons, there's something wrong. So a motor would be the first step. If the motor's super rusted out and looks terrible, then obviously it could be a motor, but um, could be worse. So be uh, vigilant on that because if ETS on eBay, a used like OEM one, it's probably 225. A BTS trim fix, which we used in our uh, video a couple, like a month ago or so, look at yeah. the queue, it's back there. Um, that's 75 bucks, works really well, but there's wiring involved, obviously, so there's that. Um, the only other thing to check right now would be the uh, the, the actual uh, carbon seal on the drive shaft. So we'll pull that and show you what to look for. All right, so now we're just checking the drive shaft boot, which is on the PTO, and we're also checking the carbon seal or a carrier bearing if you have a 95 you're looking at or below. So uh, on either side of this cover that's covered with the PTO, there's two wing nuts, undo the wing nuts. Also, just as I've gotten a ton of these throughout the years, if they have the washers still on with the wing nut and they didn't like go to take it off and then didn't realize there was a washer and they dropped them in the hall and forgot about them forever, chances are this thing was never taken off because I've very, very, very rarely taken off that rear uh, shroud and the, not the washers have been on there. So. That's a good sign if the washers are on there. Either somebody worked on it that paid attention to detail and we actually gave a crap, or it's never been tampered with. So, so far, in our opinion, this thing's never been touched. Again, 27 hours, why would it be? But now we have that thing off, we can take a look at our boot. So our boot uh, looks to be in incredibly good shape. And I mean, like, looks like a damn new boot, but I know for a fact it's not a new boot because these are OEM clamps. If they were ones from OSD or something else, uh, they look a tiny bit different than that. The uh, actual carbon seal looks very, very good. It's tight to it still. This boot has a lot of flex. It's not dried out. If it's dried out or this carbon seal looks like, I don't know, the thickness of a penny, then it's worn out. Um, so all of that looks good. None of this is like incredibly rusted, obviously, because it would be rusted if, oh, hey, look at this. We can fix the rear box now. Oh, there There's you your uh, two tabs that go up in the box to ground out your spark plug so you don't go kabooey. But um, I'm not sure what this is. There's our heater kicking on, lovely timing. Uh, I'm not sure what this is, but uh, looks to be a stopper of some sort. Oh, this was for a battery, like a, like a water fill battery. All right, we don't care about that. Um, other thing to look at is your uh, rear uh, actual water valve. So. If you pull the cover off, now again, some people are not gonna let you do this. This is more of like, you bought the thing and you wanna go through it more. If you pull this cover off and you pull on this boot, yeah, so um, that should not have come out. There's obviously particles inside of this thing. The bottom clamp is rusted, but the boot seems to be okay. So if you try to seat it, you should be able to pull on it without coming it out. If you can pull on it now without it coming out, it's a good water valve. If not, I recommend replacing it because if that thing goes, it will either sink or because it blew out, it'll either sink the hull or get a bunch of water in it or it will uh, cut off your water line and overheat your pipe. How do we know that? Mm. Mm. Okay. Uh, also, while you're back here, you can visually look at all your water lines, uh, look for any blockages, whatever, dried out, cracking, same thing for these. These rarely ever dry out or crack, but Take a visual inspection of all your lines and if they are bad, replace them. Uh, we've said many times we get them from osdmarine.com and we use all Tiguan lines. There's tons of videos on how to do water lining and everything else. Uh, so yeah, just visually inspect everything. The other thing to do too is to grab this rubber tube back here that connects your water box to your actual outlet and squeeze it. So squeeze it in a bunch of places. If it feels like it's real thin somewhere or it's like kind of like gummy, then you know the engine overheated. And that's something to look out for because this thing can close on you while you're riding and flood out your engine. Because if it closes, it has water coming in and it's got nowhere to go, so it'll just dump into your cylinders. Done that once. That sucks. Um, other thing to do too is that once you get in the hall and you're visually inspecting everything else, look for color dis uh, what do you call that? Color what? Dis distortion, color distortion we'll call it. Um, look for something that changed color. So if you're looking at like a 95, 96, 97, your engine should be pretty white with a purple pipe or a white pipe. If that has turned like a milky, yellowy white, the engine's overheated. If this silver engine were to look like a real dark silver engine, the engine's been hot. So those are a couple things you can visually see right off the bat. 
uh, before compression tests or anything, if, some, if you've had something overheat and you ask them about it and they're like, hey man, is this thing ever overheated? Like, has it ever burned up, whatever? And if they go, oh yeah, it has, but I've done the cylinders, whatever else, then you're probably okay. But if they're like, no, that's not right, overheated, I'd be leery of it because that could lead to a full engine build. And like we went through in our other video, full engine build, by the time you're done, 15, 1700 bucks, a lot of money. So Easy. just be aware of what you're buying. Cause we bought this thing for 2750, but we bought it for 2750 cause it is mint. And we know that by the time we're done with it, it's gonna be the cleanest example 98 that's ever come out of the garage. So we were fine with that. So yeah. Next thing we should check is the oil. So what Nick likes to do is do a little dab do on the hull there to see what color it is. XPS oil, which is what you should be putting in there, is red. Bombardier mineral oil is? Uh, like a tannish brown. -ish. Tannish brown, which this oil is neither. It's like black. Yeah, so either it just needs to be changed or they didn't use OEM oil, which if you've used generic oil, you know that there are some issues that go with it. Yes. Um, which we recommend spending the money and getting the XPS oil just uh, for ease of mind, and it's what's required. There are some naysayers that say, like, it doesn't matter the oil. In my opinion, the oil was engineered for not only the rotary valve, but the rave valves. So you should be using C2 oil. I don't yep. use anything but C2 oil unless it's in a race boat, which in my engine, I still, in my engine loop that's for my wet bath for the uh, actual rotary shaft, I use XPS oil and then I use uh, Maxima 927 for my mixture, but this is not a race boat. So I would 100% use XPS oil or at least mineral oil if you don't want to spend the dough on the synthetic. I mean, for something you ride a few times a year, I would spend the extra money, but that's just me. Yeah. That way you know when you get out in the water and you hit that button, she's gonna fire right up. For sure, bro. And hopefully you'd be able to rash and thrash her. Yeah. Get down and dirty. Yeah. You don't wanna be that guy stuck at the beach. No. No. No one likes that guy. No one likes that guy. Fucking prick. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I'm in the next step. I'm sorry for being that guy. <laughs> okay, so obviously this covers something that you're gonna walk up to and be able to put the key on and at least test all these items. If you're going to buy something that somebody's like, oh, it just needs a desk post or like something stupid like that. Prepare yourself, buy a desk post because I've seen that or like ones like needs a starter relay. Well, that's easy. If it needs, if it truly just needs a starter relay, you can pull the rear box, take a longer flathead screwdriver or Phillips, doesn't matter at that point, connect the two posts together and it should turn over. If it doesn't turn over, if it's locked, whatever, then you know it's not just a starter solenoid. They may not let you do that, but if they don't let me do that, then I'm walking anyways. Electrical wise, there's really nothing you can test besides bringing a box in and see if it works other than taking off that rear PTO guard and and like mechanically turning over the engine by, by itself just to know it spins over. You won't know compression, you won't know anything like that. So it's a risk you have to be willing to take. But um, as long as you follow like somewhat of this stuff, you should be pretty gravy. If I it was me, I would plan right away no matter what on doing maintenance items. I don't care if the guy says it was just done or not, I'd do it anyways. I would do fuel lines, oil lines, water lines, a car rebuild, check your exhaust, see if you need to patch that up. If you do, do it at the same time you have all the stuff blown apart. New spark plugs, new oil filter if you still have oil injection. Um, I probably, if you don't have two keys, I'd find somebody to program a key. There's people online and stuff that do it. Uh, the fuel gauge to me is not really that big of a deal. Some, it is to some people, not to me. I just fill it up, whatever. You can visually see it when you pop the seat anyways. But after that, get yourself some super clean, super clean out the whole thing, get it crispy. And that's something you could do on the oil leak, right? If you think that maybe when they were filling the oil, it overflowed and it got down to the hull and that's why the oil is there, that'd be really easy to take care of. You put it on your trailer to, you know, spray it up with, with super clean, let it sit for a little bit, tilt it up, power wash the whole thing out, make it spotless. And then if you leave it sit, it's gonna present itself again. So if you have all your oil out and you've sprayed it in a tank, got all that, all that stuff out from underneath it because it's gonna migrate underneath it. If you've got the whole thing clean on the inside and then you come back a couple days later and you're like, oh shit, there's oil in here. Then you know for sure it's got a oil leak and you have to take the oil lines. I wouldn't necessarily replace all the oil lines right off the bat if it doesn't have a leak and it's got somewhat of clean oil in it. Um, only because when you start, well, on this case, we would pump all this oil out of here or we'd suck all the oil out of here. We would 
put a, a suction up to our, our actual uh, return line, and as we're filling it with, an, with our new oil, we're gonna suck that out. So all of that old oil comes out and doesn't mix together because sometimes when you use two different types of oils, they coagulate and it turns like incredibly bad with no lubrication. It'll take out a brass gear, ask me how I know. Um, so definitely, if you think the wrong oil's in it, if there's a little bit in it and you think you can burn it out, go burn it out. Otherwise, start filling, sucking it out. Um, but that would be one way to find a leak. So definitely, if you, if you have oil injection still and you're at this step to where you're replacing or you're rebuilding carbs anyways, you're gonna be right there. Replace your oil injection lines. They're 116th lines, they're Tiguan. You can get them on Amazon for like 12 bucks. Replace those lines just for peace of mind, bleed out the system, put a new oil filter in. All the maintenance stuff you see us do on our channel or we're talking about right now is on our channel. So definitely use those uh, little bit of uh, pieces that we have for your, your teaching or knowledge, whatever you wanna say, to bring your ski up to speed so that you know you're good. The one last thing I'll mention is that if you have no clue, which you should have no clue anyways, you're buying a used item, um, definitely pull the cone on your jet pump and replace that gear oil because if it's bad or has water in it, it can fail pretty quickly if it's getting used again. All right guys, I think that's gonna wrap up this week's video. We hope you enjoyed uh, the insight that we have to share. Buyer's guide, bro. Buyer's guide, that's right, buyer's guide. That sounds, that sounds so corny, but anyway, um, if, if we did miss something or you feel like you wanna chime in, drop a comment below. Um, I think it would be beneficial if we started some sort of discussion about other things to look for. Again, for someone like me who's still kind of learning, this, this is kind of why we wanted to make this video. Um, so hope you guys enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, drop a comment below and check out other videos. Until then, we will see you all next week.